Okay, welcome everyone to this continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my favorite fields, whatever you want to call it. I will show you a theorem anyway, but I'm, I guess I'm strictly speaking more talking about fields of mathematics. And here is one of my favorites, uh, obviously, because it's a list of my favorites, but anyway, <laughs> one of my favorites, uh, geometric group theory, which I like so a lot because um, it's kind of a really nice mixture between combinatorics and analysis. Um, whatever that means, analysis in this case is usually called geometry, but you'll see what I mean. Um, anyway, because I kind of feel like this is really nice and re really lovely when two seemingly very different fields, whatever that means, kind of mix and give something nice. So as a young student, you always like uh, algebra and analysis. They're really, like, really different, but in the end, really what, where the exciting stuff is happening is where both of them kind of mix nicely and you could study kind of one from the point of the other uh, and kind of they're, they're two sides of the same coin and you can play one against the other. And geometric group theory is a good example where you uh, actually use analysis tools to do group theory, which is more usually more part of combinatorics or algebra. Um, but to get us all started, so group theory, the so group theory was invented quite a while ago. Uh, it took a while until it was re really called a field, but the idea is that um, groups formalize symmetries. So originally, well, people were thinking about symmetries for a long time, but kind of originally the concept of a group came up as permutation groups um, acting on roots of polynomials. This is like Galois theory. So the whole idea of Galois theory is that you have permutation groups, they permute the roots of a polynomial, that the symmetries in the roots of the polynomial and yeah, from there you can then just study the abstract properties of a group. Because kind of the kind of the point here I want to make is kind of a little bit like with the number uh, number three is just somewhat an abstract object, but they really come up as crucially and they appear in the wild, and that's where they really are important. They are important via their incarnations, right? Three apples or three whatever, right? Many incarnations for the same abstract concept. Um, and for groups, it's it's the same. So an abstract group was developed, the theory of abstract groups was developed much later than the incarnations, but an abstract group is usually something like given by some rules, some algebraic rules how you stack things together, um, but they really thrive through their applications, um, uh, through their appearance as symmetries of something. So here the symmetric group S4 are the symmetries of the tetrahedron. By symmetries, I mean whatever type of operation you can do, and the system remains unchanged. So symmetries have been have been of crucial importance throughout mathematics and the history of science in general, and maybe even the history of history, if you want, the history of humanity. Um, yeah, and it's like totally believable that uh, group theory should be important because it's like the easy formulation, the mathematical formulation, mathematics is always easy, keep that in mind, the mathematical formulation of symmetry. And an abstract group is really tied to its symmetries. That's what I want to say here. Uh, yeah, sure, the three is an abstract concept, but we always kind of like to think of them as something concrete. And similarly, a uh, group, yeah, is an abstract concept, but it really lives through its uh, kind of appearance in the wild, let's say, a symmetry groups of objects or something. And then people started exactly this point of view. Symmetry groups of something, it's kind of the Klein program, the Erlang program, um, started a long, long time ago. And essentially people realized that there are two types of symmetries which are much, much easier to study than the general like abstract group framework. And let me call them finite symmetries and continuous symmetries. So finite symmetries is what you think they are, like symmetries of a like like a molecule or something, where you have a finite number of rotations. Here you have a th threefold rotation and a symmetry, and maybe you have a flip symmetry in this molecule as well, right? So you can also flip the molecule. But there's certainly finitely many uh, symmetry axes of that molecule, and so finite groups is the study of symmetries of discrete objects, if you want. And yeah, finite group theory was developed kind of early on, and it's of course still in development. There are still theorems which are not known about finite groups, and finite groups get pretty, pretty complicated. But in principle, it was doable, and people did it using tools from algebra mostly. And at the same time, roughly, 
and there was this idea of lead groups which you could think of as just symmetries of continuous objects like rotations of space it's now a continuous operation because it can rotate by an arbitrary angle right? and again like very similar to, to finite groups they kind of play a special role in in the story and they're kind of much easier than the general class of groups and they have been studied early on mostly using um from the from the start mostly using uh algebraic methods and uh, some kind of some flavor of analysis but mostly algebraic methods mostly combinatorial methods depends a bit what your ground field is but let's say kind of the classical lead groups over the complex numbers can be again mostly studied uh using ideas certainly ideas from analysis but then methods mostly from combinatorics and algebra just kind of uh very exciting if you go to real lead groups it kind of changes you need a lot of analysis to study them but kind of this this dichotomy here between the discrete ones which you clearly want to study using algebra and let's say the continuous ones where you need some form of analysis to study them um has been around for quite a while so whether you really then study the ones that obviously want analysis, the continuous ones, using hard for analysis is a very different question. But certainly ideas from analysis entered Lie groups very, very early on. And essentially, you take a derivative, you go to a Lie algebra, and then push the problem, some, at least some problems, again, into the realm of algebra. But analysis and continuous methods were around for those from the start, which kind of makes sense, right? Finite is discrete. And continuous is, well, clearly you want some methods from analysis. And then there's this large class of groups, which people weren't really able to study for a long time. And they kind of sit in between. They're not really continuous objects. Yeah? They're not really finite objects either. They somewhat sit in between. And let me give you an example. So let's say you act on an infinite binary tree. An infinite binary tree is clearly nothing finite. <laughs> and it's also clearly nothing continuous. It's somewhere sitting in between. And let's say your group is generated by those uh, four operations. So the little triangles means that the tree, so the infinite tree really goes like everywhere, right? It just never stops. It's an infinite tree. Um, and the little triangles mean that part remains uh, fixed and then you have to swap. So A just swaps the two branches, and B, C, D do this fun operation where you just should look at the first three slices and then repeat whatever you do in the first three slices. And for the first three slices, you have three different ways where they're kind of fixing one of them or permuting the others. And those are B, C, D. And you can, uh, so this famous group, the Grigor Shuk group, is generated by those symmetries acting on a binary tree. And it's not difficult to see that this group, well, it's not trivial, but it's not too difficult to see that this group is not finite, but it's also not a continuous group. You have a very, very discrete action here, actually, on a, on a binary tree, right? A binary tree, if you want, is just a sequence of zeros and ones. Let's say zero means you go left, one means you go right. So you just act on a series of zeros and ones, whatever that is, and do some operations on them on an infinite series. And this is clearly not a continuous object so this is somewhat out of out of this uh, realm of study right now because up to a certain point people were mostly studying finite groups and groups of lead type and yeah so here you're kind of stuck with those and it's not quite clear how you should approach uh, those types of groups and for those type of groups which are kind of most groups in a certain sense uh, geometric group theory was uh, developed and geometric group theory asks questions of the form, uh, something related to geometry, something related to topology, something related to metric spaces, to uh, analytic methods that you can use. So geometric group theory attacks discrete groups using analytic methods, if you want to uh, kind of summarize it. And here, for example, is an example of what type of a theorem you can write down about those groups. Um, so a finally generated group has polynomial growth if and only if it has a nilpotent subgroup of finite index and nilpotent subgroup of finite index you can read this as it's essentially finite and growth means like okay you write down you, you fix some presentation some generators and relations for your group whatever it is and then you can write on words and you count the number of uh, words 
of a given length that represent different elements. So it gives you a function and you study the function, the growth of this function. So as an easy example, if you only have finite elements in total, so for finite groups, the function is clearly bounded. Yeah? Eventually you have picked up all of them, so the function is bounded, which is definitely polynomial growth, even bounded. And you can't do much better, so Nilpotent subgroup of finite index, as I said, it essentially means it's finite, and yeah, so this thing grows uh, polynomial if and only if there's a Nilpotent index of finite, uh, Nilpotent subgroup of finite index. So you can say something about the other groups. They most of the time have some form of an exponential growth. Uh, if you write down this growth in the number of uh, number of elements you find per word length. And yeah, so this is a standard example. Yeah, but not a standard, a really good example, actually, of what geometric group theory studies without going too much into details, what the geometry here really is. But there's some analytic method that you use here to study. In this case, the polynomial growth. So then growth is something you would expect more from uh, um, analysis, right? And yeah, another example, the free groups. So essentially what I just showed you is everything that is finite-ish has polynomial growth, and that's an if and only if. Um, the other extreme are free groups. Free groups are of exponential growth, and this is like really easy to see. Let's say you have a free group generated and maybe a and b is not a good x and y generated by x and y so you can just write down any type of word in x and y and if you just count the number of them of a given length this will grow like two to the n so you clearly have some exponential growth here okay so the other extreme are free groups and there was an open question for a long time if there's anything in between which has not polynomial growth so it's more than polynomial it's not a finite group but it's less than exponential. And do such groups exist? And yeah, there's, there are quite a few of them, but it took a while to find kind of the first example. And the first example is our friend here, uh, the Grigorship group again, so where you act on this binary tree, which is like a nice way of seeing that it's not finite, so it grows super polynomial, and it's still not very far away from, from something really large, so it grows uh, sub-exponential. And the Precise growth is, as far as I know, still not known, but you can somehow bound it between uh, those two things. So here is rough, this one here is roughly the famous e to the square root of n, which is uh, one of the famous conjectural lower bounds for growth in this case, and here, whatever, e to the n to the 0 0.7 something. So it's of sub-exponential growth, but still much, much faster than any type of polynomial growth. And these are the types of questions you kind of study in uh, geometric group theory. And in this case, in this video, I decided to kind of throw out the geometry out of geometric group theory. If you would put now, let's say, a metric on your space of words or something, then you could use more real geometric methods. And I just focused on kind of analytic ones because I found it a little bit easier to explain it in the video. But anyway, that's roughly what you do. You study discrete objects, right, symmetries of a binary tree using continuous methods. Essentially, that's what you do. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.